Hi, I'm health reporter Tegan Taylor. And I'm physician and journalist Dr Norman Swan. So I can hear you slurping there, Tegan. What are you, <laughs> what are you slurping? Um, I've got a cup of tea next to me today. A cup of tea? Right. Yeah, very off-brand now that I think about what we're here to talk about today, actually. Yeah. What's your pattern of caffeine consumption during the day? Uh, we've talked about this before. I, I am a coffee drinker. I drink uh, coffee or three in the morning, yeah. uh, but it's after midday now, which means it's tea only, and even that feels a bit sketchy if I want to go to bed nice and early tonight. We're so alike. I know. You, you. I feel like I've heard you say to me before that you you just down like four shots of coffee every morning. Uh, I have to know what my first one is because that's a table, t- you know, one of those stovetop things, one of those Italian things. Mm-hmm. And we stopped working the other day, actually. I had to completely oh, no. clean it out, but you know, now I'm back onto it. That must be at least two shots and then another those, couple of shots. That coffee is thick. The coffee that comes out of one of those coffee pot things, it's, uh, it's viscous. Yeah, it's almost Turkish, mm. you know, Turkish-Italian. Yeah, but like you, right about midday, my taste changes. I want a nice cup of char. Isn't it nice that we live in a time where we have access and choice about these things? It's actually more recent than I realised. Indeed, but is it making us live longer? Which is what this week's What's That Rash is all about. It's the show where we answer the health questions that everyone is asking. So Norman, today's question comes from Lucy, who says, love the show, the chat, the ribbing. Oh, well, there's plenty of that to come, Lucy. A question, there's a lot of emerging evidence about the health benefits of coffee. What are the impacts of adding dairy or other milks in relation to these health benefits? And are there any differences in how coffee is brewed or prepared? And then she adds, please ignore instant coffee. I'm from Melbourne. So, <laughs> which I... We're well, on the same anybody page should ignore instant coffee. You don't have to be from Melbourne. <laughs> <laughs> um, Although, you know, when I was a lad in Glasgow, you know, the epitome of coffee drinking was that sort of coarse, granular instant coffee. Everybody thought that was fantastic. I remember being asked to make a coffee for a parent or a friend or something at some stage, and I just put coffee grounds in water because I thought that's how you made coffee is you just mixed it in with hot water and apparently coffee grounds don't just dissolve and turn into fake coffee and no, to be brewed. That's what they learned a long time ago. So Lucy's question really speaks to something that I have seen a lot in that every time you're sort of looking through the health section of a news website or looking at journal articles as we do, Norman, is that each week it seems to be like the, all of the researchers are in alignment that there's a, the week where we're good on coffee and there's the week where we're bad on coffee and it just flips back and forth every week. Coffee's good for you. Coffee's bad for you. All right. So if you're if you're short of time this week listening to watch that rash, this is going to be a good week for you. Okay. You know you can get on with oh, somebody you get, else. Just spoil alert. TLDR. That's go right. On. Yeah. But we'll take our time in terms of how we get there. All right. So I'm going to just give you like give me the straight answer, good or bad. Good. Okay. Good. All right. That's good. We got that out of the way. Let's. In fact, the, I think it was the British Medical Journal a few years ago said, you know, we're fed up publishing papers on coffee. Let's just accept that it's good. Okay. All right. Well, if it's good enough for the BMJ, for our purposes today, it's probably good enough for us. But let us get into this. And I should mention, this is not the first time we've talked about coffee on WhatsApp Rash. One of our very first episodes was on caffeine and caffeine addiction, where we talked about caffeine withdrawals. And headaches. So if you want to listen to that, you can go back and listen to that episode. But today is about coffee specifically. And like all good stimulants, Norman, this one has a great origin story. What is the origin story? Go on, give it to us. Okay, so in this story, there's a goat herd and his name's Kaldi. And he lives in Ethiopia uh, around 850 CE, the, you know, AD. And Kali noticed that his goats were frolicking and jumping around and realised that they were eating the berries from this bush. He was like, all right, well, if the goats like it, I'm going to have a go. And he had a go and felt exhilarated and great and felt really good from eating the coffee beans. So then he took it to the elders of the village and said, oh, have have a go of this. And they had a taste of it and they were like, yuck. And they spat them out into a nearby fire. But then... They smelt the coffee roasting and then they were like, oh, no, I do like this. And then they pulled them out of the fire and sent them. This sounds like a true story. (laughs) Absolutely. And then for some reason they were like, let us pour boiling water on them. And that's how coffee was first created. There is no proof that Kaldi existed, but it's a good story. And do you know what it reminds me of? I know that with tea, there's a story about like, a Chinese princess who sits under a tree with like a cup of hot water and the leaves fall in and she discovers that it tastes good and it's tea. I just love the idea that there is one magical being that kind of just happened to discover 
this product that we all kind of hold so dear now. But of course, someone must have been the first person to try it. Well, yes, it has the ring of truth about it. I've ever told you, told you, just changing subject for a moment, the best Are you cup- a princess sitting under a tree? No, no, I wasn't a princess, but I was about a, a four-year-old and the best cup of tea I ever had. And still you were to, four? Well, about four or five, maybe. We had a railway line, a goods railway line, just at the end of our driveway. And every day, these railway workers would come to a shed just there, and they'd brew up tea in this little tin, pretty much like the army, And then they would have their jam sandwiches and I'd go along and they'd give me a taste of their tea from this tin. And I still to this day have not tasted tea as good as the railway workers' tea across the road from the house. That is really beautiful. But they they wouldn't have ever had coffee. Okay, so that's a a cultural thing then, is it? Why would you, why do you say that so decisively? Oh, it was the day, I would imagine, oh, I don't know, at the age of four whether there was instant coffee in the shops. No, the reason I ask that is because the kind of migration of coffee and in its stronghold that it has on us now is pretty recent and and really interesting. I think people know about in the United States, one of the reasons why coffee became popular there was because tea was unpopular for uh, independence reasons. But in Australia, tea was much more popular here for a really long time up until the beginning of the 20th century. I think because it was a little easier to obtain here. Coffee, they couldn't get it to grow well in Australia. It kind of petered out after the first beans were brought over from Rio de Janeiro with one of the earlier fleets. But then during the wars, there were a lot of American... Well, so what you're getting to just before you get to the war yeah, yeah. is that we would have been on the colonial export route America abandoned for a while, which was a market for British tea from the Indias. Yeah, we were a ready market for something and they didn't have the states anymore. Yeah, no, it's a good point. But then in Australia, basically, it came in sort of in the Second World War. There were a lot of American soldiers here. They had coffee. That was where they were being billeted into Australian homes and they, they wanted coffee and Australian homes basically figured out how to make it. And then this is how recent Australian coffee culture is. Obviously, the 1950s is when we saw a big influx of migrants from Greece and Italy. And the Italians especially brought their espresso machines with them. And now, kind of anywhere you go in the Western world, Australians are sort of synonymous with good quality coffee, like flat whites. It's it's part of what we're known for now, but it's quite a recent thing. Yeah, and the, and the first coffee shops in Sydney and Melbourne, they were incredibly successful because the profit margin on an espresso coffee was enormous. Oh, I don't know if a coffee shop owner these days would say the same thing, though. I think they're really feeling you know, the they're pinch. complaining about it, but it, you know, once upon a time, it was a good business to be in. Can I tell you something? I am repeating a story that I have read, and I don't know if this is true or not, but it's really fun. So you know how we were talking about the Danish milk thing a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. So the question was about dairy causing acne and our correspondent said that when they were in Denmark and they ate dairy over there, they didn't get acne and then when they were in Australia, they did. We were nice about it, but we were basically like, probably not. This story makes me think maybe some differently. So apparently the flat white, obviously an Australian thing, New Zealanders will say that it belongs to them. It doesn't, it's ours. It seems to, according to a, um, a researcher who's written a book about the history of coffee, it seems to date back to the 1980s and that the change in the diet of the cows that were supplying the milk for coffees meant that the milk wouldn't froth in the same way. And so cafes had posted signs that read, no cappuccinos, only flat whites. And I have done some digging around and there does seem to be something about the cow's diets affecting the ability for the milk to froth, but I really can't get to the bottom of it. Well, we should go to our feedback in the middle of What's That Rash rather than the end because we've had an email from Jono, who's a former farmer and grazier, who says, what I do know is that the diet of cows affects their milk, not just Danish cows versus Aussies, (laughs) but Aussie cows from season to season according to the way the feed is affected. Years ago, he lived and worked in Dubbo, which was then the boundary of good coffee, the coffee, the cappuccino line. <laughs> the cappuccino. <laughs> Some people would argue the cappuccino line is a little bit further east, but nonetheless, I'm sure you get a good coffee in Dubbo these days. The cappuccino man used to make superb coffees in winter and spring, and then usually sometime in October, the local milk would no longer fluff or froth. He explained that when the feed got too dry, the cattle didn't get the proteins they needed from the local pasture to make frothable milk. At that stage, he had to resort to cappuccino milk, 
which was manufactured with added gelatin to allow the froth to hold together. Wow. So here we go, a seasonal effect on frothable milk. So there is something to it. But we should really get back to Lucy's question, shouldn't we? I'm having a lot of fun. I don't know if we should. <laughs> Okay, no, no, no. Let's talk about health because what we need to talk about is the evidence for or against coffee as a health-giving substance and then the effects of milk upon that. So let us start with the coffee. Okay, caveat to whatever we say from now on, there have been almost no randomised trials of coffee over an extended period of time with any sort of meaning. So what we're looking at is population effects based on caffeine consumption, trying to control for other things. Now, at one stage, if you were a coffee drinker, you were also a smoker. Nowadays, if you're a coffee drinker, you're probably not a smoker. Mm. Do you have a healthier lifestyle? You talked about Greeks and Italians. So they were eating... Um, oh, no, Norman, I've forgotten my bell. Okay, so they're eating this kind of diet, funny diet that they have in <laughs> Greece and Italy and, um, and and all things, although they were smokers. So the, the, the confounders with Within the coffee story are huge. But when you've got study after study after study and they've controlled for these so-called confounders as much as they can, the bottom line here is that there appears to be a lower risk of cancer, lower risk of type 2 diabetes, lower risk of coronary heart disease as it's reflected in heart attacks and strokes in people who drink coffee each day. And what strengthens that association is the more coffee you drink, the more uh, up to a certain point. Dose response. Yeah, that's right. In other words, if it was just coffee drinking blah generally, you wouldn't think too much about it. But the more you drink up to about four or five cups a day, the more benefit that you get. And I'm sure they don't go beyond four or five because who apart from you or I would drink <laughs> more than four shots of coffee? Nobody's really too sure why. There are polyphenols in coffee, which reduce oxidative stress. So these like antioxidant kind of things. Yeah. The sorts of things that we see, well, we kind of debunk these a little bit in our red wine episode as well, but they do have a health effect. There's also um, oils in coffee, which may well be different depending on how you brew it, which we'll come back to in a moment, and that they have an effect on the absorption of food from your stomach and also cholesterol levels. But here's the situation we've talked about many times before, which is when you observe a health effect from some behaviour or substance, medical researchers go into overdrive to find a physiological explanation for it. I was literally holding myself back from asking about the mechanism, but here you are anyway. Yeah, they don't really know the mechanism. It probably is associated with these polyphenols, maybe the oils that come out of the coffee beans and those would be the main things. It could be also a trade-off is that you might, when you have your morning coffee, you might be less likely to have breakfast and therefore your meal patterns are different during the day. We don't know the answer to that. How do we know that it's the polyphenols that might be having a, a health effect? Because it looks as though that decaffeinated coffee gives you the same effect. Aha. Uh -huh. So it's something in the coffee bean itself independent of the caffeine. And again, you can go back and listen to our caffeine episode. There are benefits and hazards to, associated with caffeine, mainly related to anxiety, restlessness and insomnia, maybe controlling blood pressure. And certainly if you're pregnant, you don't want to be having too much coffee every day. Because it raises your blood pressure? Yeah, or, and a high coffee intake is associated with fetal loss. In other words, the baby not surviving or lower birth weight. So by and large, it's, it's wise to say we. Yeah. Okay, if we're talking about that, I feel like we do need to talk about dose because you said high caffeine intake. If we're talking about pregnancy loss, I feel like having a really clear number about what the recommendation is is important. A maximum of 200 milligrams of caffeine a day, which is about two or three espressos. Okay, so now we need to talk about the milk effect. There's mixed evidence you won't be shocked to discover um, <laughs> about black coffee. Most of the studies suggest that black coffee is what's associated with the benefits. But when you look at studies done in the test tube where they've deliberately combined black coffee with milk, you find more biologically active polyphenols. Oh, so the milk is perhaps supercharging the coffee in some way. It might be. It tends to be skim milk from the studies, but whether they've fully studied full fat milk, I don't know. Certainly skim milk may enhance 
the effect of these antioxidants, but we don't really know the effect of full cream milk on, on that. It's hard with coffee because people have their coffee so differently. If you're having a black coffee or if you're having sort of like a drip coffee or something like that, you might have a splash of milk in it the way you will with a cup of tea. But in Australia, I think a very typical way of drinking coffee is a flat white or a latte where you're effectively having a cup of milk with an espresso shot in it. And that's a really different dose of milk to a splash that you'd have in a black coffee. Yes. And it also goes to the way you brew the coffee. And that's a huge debate. So if you go to different countries, they brew coffee in different ways. You go to Turkey, they brew in a little pot, just like um, the railway workers Mm. opposite my parents' house in Glasgow. And you get the coffee grounds in there with the coffee and you get this delicious coffee. Uh, Vietnamese coffee is quite similar to that in some ways. In Italy, you get a mix of espresso and stovetop coffee, which is more high-pressure percolation. In America, you get filtered coffee. Now, a lot of their research in this area is US research. Mm. So all they know about, they don't know know about good (laughs) coffee, all they know about is filtered coffee. And when you read the literature and you just skim through it, filtered coffee appears to have more of these polyphenolic compounds, They have more of the caffeine than espresso coffee. But actually, when you look at what's in espresso coffee, unsurprisingly, because of the pressure the grounds are put under, espresso coffee has more caffeine and more polyphenols in it per ml than filtered coffee. It's just that we tend to drink less of it than you, you know, when you're drinking filtered coffee because it's so piss weak, you, you drink <laughs> gallons of the stuff. Whereas espresso, just, you just knock it back. All know? I'm hearing is my my existing knowledge of you, Norman, as someone who loves coffee-flavoured gelato and visiting Italy, is that this is just a, an Italy versus US <laughs> yes. war happening in your head. No self-justification. You know, it has to be said that increasingly in the United States, people are flocking to expatriate Australians who are opening up coffee shops and realising <laughs> the benefits of good coffee. So you've got to be careful about this different way of brewing coffee is that some ways of brewing coffee will increase the phenolic content and make it more concentrated, but that's a function of volume as well. So if you drink filtered coffee, then you will get the polyphenols and you will get the caffeine because you're drinking more of it. But if you have a couple of espresso shots, you're getting a pretty good dose. Are people really drinking coffee for health benefits, though? Like, let's be real. They're drinking coffee because they like the taste. It's a fun little ritual and it helps you stay awake when you haven't slept enough the night before. Yeah, I don't know anybody who drinks it for the health benefits. It's just a sense of relief that it's not doing you any harm. I I suppose what follows from that is like, if you don't drink coffee, should you start? Or should it just make you feel a bit better about not quitting it, like ignoring those headlines that seem to promise that it's bad for you somehow? I, I think a lot of people who, I mean, this is anecdotal, but I think a lot of people who stop drinking coffee is because of the psychological effects. We haven't talked about that. So talk me through what you mean. There is an increase in anxiety, There's probably a reduction in depression, but there's certainly an increase in anxiety and insomnia. People don't like that sense of anxiety, that twitchiness that they get with coffee, and some people are sensitive to that. That's obviously if they're drinking caffeinated coffee. And some people don't like the idea that if they don't take it for a day, they get a headache and they get withdrawal effects. And there are people who just feel better when they don't drink coffee anymore. Me? I couldn't cope. (laughs) So bottom line for Lucy then. Coffee is good for you. You don't have to drink caffeinated coffee to get the benefits. And if you put a bit of milk in the coffee, the chances are you're enhancing the effects of the coffee rather than detracting from them. It feels too clean. I feel like there should be more caveats here, Norman. I feel like there should be some health warning. Don't drink too much or don't drink too much full fat dairy or something like that. Is it really that simple? Yeah, I think it is. And just pivot at midday to a nice cup of tea. I've nearly finished mine right here. Oh, we need a sound effect for tea as well as the Mediterranean <laughs> diet, clearly. A dunking tea bag sound effect. A whistling kettle. Or the sound of the fire for the railway men. Oh, yeah, the sound of a train. Oh, that's really lovely. You never sort of went back and tried to recreate the tin by the train tracks? No, occasionally tried it camping. Didn't seem to work quite as well on a gas stove. Well, if you're a railway worker and you have a tea recipe that you want to share with Norman, you can email us, thatrash at abc.net.au, also where you can send your questions and your feedback. See you next week. See you then. 